It's now my great pleasure to introduce our guest speaker today. Hardash Mehta was elected to the Canadian Wind Energy Association, also known as CANWI, Board of Directors in 2008 to help formulate and guide wind energy growth in Canada. Passionate about environmental st sustainability in the energy sector and with experience on over 2,000 megawatts of wind energy projects, she was elected to the chair of the CANWI board at the end of 2010. Our dash has been involved in wind energy in various capacities for 10 years. She told me when we were having our lunch that in the 1990s, her dad told her that going into wind energy was probably a really good idea. She didn't listen. She thought he was nuts. She has obviously worked her way back on her own into wind energy, and uh, I think we should all be grateful that she's here. In 2010, she joined Axonia Wind Energy Canada as Director of Development and currently enjoys working with a global team of professionals dedicated to renewable energy. She holds a Bachelor of Mathematics degree from the University of Waterloo, a Master of Science degree from the University of Alberta, and an MBA degree from the Kellogg Schulich School of Business, for which she was sole recipient of the Franklin Sarisman Samard Scholarship. In addition to her professional responsibilities, Ms. Maida is an active volunteer for Child Haven International, a children's charity supporting destitute children and women in South, East, South Asia. Child Haven International is founded on uh, Gideonian ideals of equality, nonviolence, and uh, environmentally sustainable living. Uh, as I mentioned, Robert Hornrung is going to be uh, answering the questions. Robert uh, has been the president of CANWI since August 2003 and represents the interest of more than 460 members, including wind tur turbine manufacturers, component suppliers, wind energy project developers, and a broad range of service providers to the wind energy industry. He is also a board member to the Global Energy Council. Prior to joining CANWI, Mr. Hongring worked for nine years with the Pembina Institute, an environmental research and advocacy uh, organization specializing in energy and environmental issues. I would like you to uh, join me in welcoming Ardarsh to the, our podium. Thank you, Tim, for such a kind introduction. And thank you, Gowlings, as well, for sponsoring this event. In fact, Tom and I have a habit of following each other around uh, at various podiums, it seems. Um, I'd like to extend my appreciation to the Empire Club for having us here today. The timing is great. Wind energy projects are now operating in rural communities across Canada and have been proposed in many more. This has made wind energy a growing subject of public discourse in Canada and I'm very pleased to have an opportunity to talk to you about it here today at the Empire Club. But before I begin, let me tell you about why I chose to be in the wind industry. Let me tell you about my young friend, Leo. Leo is 12 months old. If Leo could talk, I know he would tell me how much he loves playing outside. He would tell me to please make wise choices so that we can protect the environment his environment, our environment. Leo is not my child, but I still care for his future. I care about what his environment will be like 50 years from now, even though I may not be around 50 years from now. I want a safe and stable future for him, a future where jobs and economic activities support and maintain the natural environment he clearly loves so much. I want to help build that future, and since I believe, and, and I sincerely believe that investments in renewable energy are critical to getting there. I'm a part of the wind energy industry in Canada, along with thousands of others, because I care about our future generations. I care about ensuring that we create, the energy we create has minimal impact on the environment and great impact on economic growth. So that's why I am working to increase the amount of wind energy in Canada's energy mix. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to talk to you about an incredible opportunity. It's the incredible opportunity that wind energy represents for Canada now and in the future. The Canadian Wind Energy Association's mandate 
is to promote the responsible and sustainable development of wind energy. With a federal election underway and one coming here in Ontario in the fall, you may hear a lot of commentary on renewable energy, especially wind energy. There will be several angles to these comments. As an association, we work hard to ensure that the dialogue on wind energy is well informed and based on factual information. I'll present to you some impressive facts and figures, and when you leave here this afternoon, I'd like to make sure you remember these important figures. 20% of Canada's electricity produced from wind. $100 billion of total private sector, private sector investment. And $50 billion of that staying here in Canada. Also 50,000 jobs across Canada. I'll get back to this after a brief status check on wind energy in Canada. Over the past 10 years, total installed wind energy in Canada has increased 20-fold. Today, we're at 4,588 megawatts of total installed capacity, meeting 2% of Canada's electricity demand. So what does that mean? Well, every 1,000 megawatts of wind produces enough clean electricity to power 300,000 homes. Each year, that is. It represents more than $2.5 billion in total private sector investments, with one and a quarter billion dollars of that injected into the Canadian economy. And it creates more than 1,000 jobs. Every 1,000 megawatts of wind energy also generates more than $3 million a year in lease payments to landowners, and also provides more than $3 million per year in new revenue for local communities through property taxes and community benefit agreements. So, with 4,588 megawatts installed as of today, wind energy in Canada produces enough clean electricity to power 1.4 million homes. That's equivalent to powering all of the homes in rural Ontario. It represents almost $6 billion in private sector investments injected into the Canadian economy. It has created more than 5,000 jobs. It generates approximately $14 million per year in lease payments to landowners, and also provides the same amount, $14 million per year, in new revenue for host communities. In 2010, just in 2010, Canada added close to 700 megawatts of new wind energy capacity to its electricity grid, representing almost a billion dollars in new private sector investment that stays in Canada. And we have only just begun. Canada has more wind energy resources than we could ever hope to use. The Canadian Wind Energy Association has established a target that would see 20% of Canada's electricity produced by wind by 2025. That's enough clean electricity to power every residence in Canada. It represents more than $100 billion in private sector investments. And about $50 billion of that stays right here in Canada. $50 billion is a big number. Let me put that into perspective. That's the same order of magnitude as our current federal deficit, except this number has a plus sign in front of it. 20% wind, wind energy penetration creates more than 50,000 jobs. It generates more than $125 million per year in lease payments to landowners, and also provides more than $125 million per year in new revenue for municipalities. Is it possible? Wind energy is the fastest growing source of new electricity generation in the world today. It has grown globally at an average rate of more than 25% per year for the past 15 years. Wind energy now is operating in more than 80 countries around the world, and it has a global total installed capacity of almost 200,000 megawatts. Globally, wind energy is already producing electricity equivalent to all of Canada's yearly electricity demand. The global wind industry employs almost half a million people. Last year alone, 
the world saw $95 billion of private sector investments in the wind industry. One trillion dollars is projected to be invested in wind energy worldwide now, uh, between now and 2020. And if Dr. Evil thinks that $100 billion is a big number, just wait till he sees three more zeros. He's going to fall off his chair. <laughs> By 2030, the global wind industry is pro projected to employ 2.5 million people. What's the current situation in countries that are leaders in wind energy? Wind energy already produces enough power to meet 20% of Denmark's electricity demand. That's where we want to be. They're already there. Wind energy, already, wind energy produces enough power to meet 13% of Spain's electricity demand, 12% in Portugal, 8% in Germany. So where does Canada rank with its 4,588 megawatts of installed capacity? We're the ninth largest producer of wind energy in the world. The good news is that we're in the top 10. But we have some work to do if we want to climb up from ninth place. Remember that global capital tends to flow like water to wherever there's least resistance. North America may still have huge untapped potential, but the fastest growing market is currently Asia. New markets in Europe and Latin America are emerging. The world is excited about wind energy. Look at China, Turkey, and Brazil. These countries are racing to find ways to attract global capital to facilitate wind energy development. The competition for global capital is intense. China. China wants to move from 45,000 megawatts of wind now to 200,000 megawatts of wind by 2020. Great Britain wants to move from 5,000 megawatts of wind now to 28,000 megawatts of wind by 2020. And Germany wants to move from 27,000 megawatts now to 42,000 megawatts by 2020. Canada needs to be in this race as well, and we have to do this by staying competitive. To attract new private investment in wind energy, Canada must have policies for stable, long-term growth in the wind energy sector. With such stability, Canada can capitalize on the opportunity to achieve our goal of 20% wind energy by 2025. That is, with stable policies attracting global capital, Canada would cash in on the opportunity to benefit from almost $100 billion of private sector investment by 2025, representing an injection of at least $50 million into the Canadian economy. We absolutely must embrace this opportunity to become a wind energy superpower. Now, I have studied other jurisdictions around the world to see how they, they are succeeding with wind energy. To compete successfully in the global wind energy industry, I see six critical keys to success. We need electricity markets to reflect the full cost of production, like environmental impacts. We need our governments to provide stable, sustained, long-term policy support for wind energy deployment, like, for example, deployment targets. We need to ensure investments in our grid help us access wind resource-rich areas and facilitate, grid, facilitate wind energy integration through stronger interconnections. We need to improve the efficiency while preserving the effectiveness of wind energy permitting and approval processes. We also need wind energy research and development to continue to improve generation efficiency, decrease energy production costs, and facilitate grid integration. And we need all wind energy project developers to work hard to build and earn community support for wind energy deployment and development. This, in fact, is one of my personal priorities as the chair of, Can of the CanWIA board this year. Let's focus on Ontario now, as it's home to most of us in this room. At over 1,600 megawatts, Ontario currently hosts more than a third of Canada's overall installed capacity. In a few more years, we will more than double our installed capacity with wind energy projects that are already contra contracted to be built. You may know that on the Ontario government released a long-term energy plan this fall.
Under this plan, we estimate that Ontario's total installed wind energy capacity will grow to 7,000 megawatts by 2018. Let's do some math again. 7,000 megawatts produces enough clean electricity to power more than 2 million homes. This represents almost $18 billion in private sector investments, with $9 billion of that staying in Canada. It also creates another 5,000 jobs for a total of around 7,000 jobs. It generates more than $20 million per year in lease payments to landowners and also provides more than $20 million per year in new revenue for host communities. I think everyone would say yes to adding more clean electricity to our grid. I think everyone would say yes to adding more jobs in Ontario. I think everyone would say yes to the tremendous economic benefit that wind energy provides to communities where wind farms exist. We all know that Ontario's manufacturing sector has struggled through some tough times recently with more than 38,000 jobs lost in the auto industry alone between 2007 and 2009. Wind turbine manufacturing and component supply has the potential to contribute to the effort to get these people back to work. Many companies in the automotive sector are actively pursuing or already engaged in new activities in the wind energy industry. In addition, colleges such as St. Lawrence College in Kingston are providing education and training to those seeking jobs in the wind energy industry. With 7,000 megawatts of installed capacity, full-time wind turbine operations and maintenance positions at farms, wind farms across Ontario will grow from 500 jobs at present to more than 2,300 jobs by 2018, and that's just in operations and maintenance. We have our CEO here, from, we have the CEO of St. Lawrence College here today, and, and he looks after these students who have made a decision to pursue training in wind energy systems. I think, I think we, applaud, we should applaud Chris for his confidence in our industry. <laughs> Besides, one of your students is going to be our bosses one day. <laughs> they see the, that tremendous opportunities exist for them in Ontario and elsewhere in Canada to be a part of an industry that provides clean electricity from safe, reliable wind energy facilities. We have to do everything we can to support them. These same students, along with many of their peers, will form a part of the wind energy industry in the near future. We know that new jobs in a region will spur additional economic development. There will be new taxpayers on the block. Local establishments will benefit from people who are able to spend a little of their hard-earned cash. Let me give you an example from personal experience. I work for Axiona Energy, a multinational renewable energy company. Just last week, Axiona Energy commissioned a 45 megawatt wind farm in Lamec, New Brunswick. A few months ago, when I visited the wind farm during its construction, I stayed in a really lovely B&B. It was called B&B au Peuplier. The owners, Geraldine and Jean, told us that their business has certainly increased due to Axiona's activities at Lamec. There's also a restaurant nearby called Petit Mousse. And the owner, René Noël, just told me yesterday that she too can attest to increased business thanks to workers at the wind farm and visitors to the wind farm stopping in frequently for a bite to eat. Wind farms can be an important source of new money in rural areas. They can provide an additional revenue stream to farming operations that currently depend on selling commodities subject to price volatility. The actual footprint of a wind turbine is small, covering only 3 to 4 percent of a wind farm's overall area, allowing farmers to continue with existing ag agricultural operations. I'd now like to provide you with some important facts about the cost of wind energy. This issue tends to be contentious, and it's because some, and some people have blamed wind energy for increasing power costs in Ontario. In reality, the Environmental Commissioner for Ontario recently stated that renewable energy costs were responsible for 1.5% of the total cost you pay for electricity today. That's about $1.50 a month on an average residential electricity bill in Ontario, about the price of a Tim Hortons coffee. Why the misconception? It is generally a result of people comparing the cost of adding wind energy to our grid today to the cost of energy from plants built decades ago. 
We are paying more for all new sources of energy, whether it's wind energy or not. The result is that electricity prices are increasing all across North America, not just in Ontario. In addition, utilities and decision makers understand that major investments also need to be made to upgrade old transmission infrastructure, regardless of what type of electricity is generating. Electricity is generated, and, and this is what's also increasing our costs. As an analogy, think of an old furnace that no longer runs efficiently. I can speak from personal experience because I had one of these in my basement. You can continue playing, paying higher gas bills due to an inefficiently running furnace. You can continue paying to have it repaired. Or you can invest in upgrading to a higher efficiency furnace, thereby lowering your gas consumption, creating less pollution, and eliminating repair bills. Either way, your costs will increase. But the new furnace has longer term benefits that the repair jobs fail to realize. In the short term, you may opt to pay off the investment in the new furnace over the course of several billing cycles, driving up the total on each bill. But over a period of time, the investment pays itself off. Decision makers recognize that major new investments in electricity production and infrastructure must consider several costs. There are initial costs, environmental costs, and life cycle costs. There are also external costs that must be considered, such as health-related costs due to pollution and safety-related costs. Wind energy compares extremely favorably with any new generation technology in all of these areas. So I think the questions we should be asking are, how much will new electricity cost compared to other forms of new electricity? And what are our best long-term options for the future? We can look at recent contracts for various types of power plants. Quebec, Ontario, and British Columbia recently awarded contracts to small hydro plants for 12 cents per kilowatt hour. New natural gas fired electricity costs more than 11 cents per kilowatt hour. And electricity generated from a new nuclear facility built on budget would cost around 15 cents per kilowatt hour. For some forms of generation like coal and natural gas, we can expect a price on carbon to drive up the costs down the road. Even without that, many of the recently built wind farms in Ontario were awarded contracts through a competitive tendering process where wind energy projects agreed to produce power more cheaply than natural gas facilities awarded contracts at the same time. In this context, the new price for wind energy projects in Ontario of 13.5 cents per kilowatt hour is clearly competitive and a reasonable investment. In reality, utilities around the world are investing in wind energy precisely because it has already demonstrated it can be cost competitive with a number of technologies. We owe it to our ratepayers to provide, to provide them with value. Wind energy provides them with that value from several perspectives. Wind energy provides value in the form of jobs, economic benefits, environmental benefits, and cost effectiveness. It also provides value in the form of safety. In Ontario, wind energy is helping to phase out coal-fired electricity generation, one of the leading causes of greenhouse gas emissions and air pollution in North America. Yes, wind energy is variable. But with improvements in forecasting and with backup generation already being provided by Ontario's existing reserve capacity, wind energy is reliable. This reserve capacity is required in the electricity system in the event of operating problems from all types of electricity generating facilities, not just wind energy facilities. That will continue to be adequate for wind energy until we get to significantly higher levels of penetration than we have today. I'm often asked, if wind energy can be a reliable source of energy. While wind is variable, most wind turbines are producing at least 75 to 80 percent of the, uh, producing energy at least 75 to 80 percent of the time, and they're available to produce energy more than 95 percent of the time. In fact, during the recent tragedy in Japan, all of Japan's wind turbines in the affected areas, including some just offshore, even ones that were hit by the tsunami, remained operational and have been producing power to help Japan address its numerous challenges. Any portfolio manager will tell you not to put all of your eggs in one basket. That goes for the electricity system as well. 
Building a safe, reliable electricity system requires diversifying our energy mix. The current level of wind penetration in Canada, about 2%, must and can grow to 20% to have a truly diversified portfolio. An energy portfolio that is safe, clean, reliable, affordable, economically beneficial, and most importantly, sustainable. So how do we make it happen? How do we ensure wind energy growth to 20% of Canada's energy mix? First, the wind energy industry needs to work harder to earn broad community support for wind energy projects. This is imperative for success. We have seen that wind energy projects can generate passionate discussion and debate in some communities, and relatively little in others. I welcome this dialogue. It tells me that wind energy is becoming mainstream. The wind energy industry needs to recognize that every community is different, that engagement must occur early and often, and that community concerns must be identified, understood, and responded to with fact-based information. We must also do a better job of educating potential host communities about the benefits that wind energy will bring. To support our industry in meeting those objectives, CANWIA released earlier this year a set of comprehensive best practices for community engagement and public consultation. These were developed with the direct input of municipal leaders across the country and from all parts of this province. Our objective is and must be continuous improvement in all aspects of our interactions with host communities and local governments. Second, capturing this opportunity will also require action by the government. There's a simple quote that I love by Mahatma Gandhi, a well-known agent of change. He said, action expresses priorities. I like simple quotes because they're easy to remember. Ontario has created a solid foundation and taken great strides to position itself as a renewable energy leader and a competitive des destination for global wind energy investment. Maintaining this position requires first and foremost policy stability. We must respect existing contracts, rules and processes. We must continue to proceed with the contracting of new wind energy projects and the construction of necessary transmission upgrades. We must also continue to establish aggressive, long-term targets for wind energy development. Can and will policies change or evolve over time? Certainly. But Ontario and the rest of Canada must remember that investors are looking for policy stability. Dramatic policy changes or making energy policy a political football involves, uh, introduces uncertainty and it increases risk. This will make Canada a less attractive destination for investment. In reality, increased policy uncertainty here in Canada will not, re will not result in less investment and jobs in the wind industry globally, but it will result in less investment and jobs in wind energy here in Canada. If Canada does not maintain a stable policy framework, I can guarantee you that wind energy jobs and dollars will go elsewhere. I think this brings us back to where we started today. I've told you that I committed my career focus to the wind energy industry because I want to contribute to a cleaner environment. I'm staying in the wind energy industry because of what we can build here. The tremendous jobs and economic growth we can create for Ontario and the rest of Canada that could truly make us a clean energy superpower. Remember the numbers I asked you to think about? 20% of Canada's electricity produced by wind, $100 billion of total private sector investment, $50 billion of that investment staying here in Canada, and 50,000 jobs across Canada. I'm convinced that by keeping the facts about wind energy at the forefront, we can achieve these tremendous economic benefits and be a world leader in wind energy development. We can do it by working in partnership with municipal governments and local residents to help communities throughout Ontario and the rest of Canada reap the benefits of wind energy. 
that will also help all, our fu all of our future generations breathe cleaner air as well. You, your children, and of course, Leo. Thank you. Robert, would you like to come to the podium and uh, answer the questions? Um, we'll get through as many of them as we can. We have a lot. Hello, hello. And I didn't write them. I'm just reading them. <clears throat> can you lift up all those cards? Yeah. <laughs> How long does it take to construct a typical WIM firm? The construction process itself is, uh, is relatively rapid. Um, can occur anywhere between usually six to nine months up to a year. And that's one of the reasons that we've seen a lot of investment globally in wind is it allows you to build at scale. You don't need to build a project that will you know, have thousands of megawatts. You can build it at a smaller scale, and you could add incrementally and very, very quickly. You are not always welcome in many rural communities. Will you back away from proposed projects where you are not welcome? Well, I think Adarsh mentioned in her remarks the importance of meaningfully and effectively engaging communities. And at the end of the day, I think it's absolutely fair to say that you can't have a successful wind energy project if you don't have broad community support. Um, unanimous support, that's difficult to achieve for anything. I think we have to strive for that. But really, if we don't secure that broad community support, you won't have success. And that's why we did things like produce our best practices document to try and ensure that at the end of the day when the wind energy industry enters a community, that it does treat that community with respect and meaningfully seeks out concerns, tries to understand them, and tries to respond to them. Do you see the day when the Great Lakes are home to major offshore wind farms? Yes, at some point I think it's almost inevitable that it will happen. Um, offshore wind represents a tremendous opportunity it's at a much, not a much, but at an earlier stage of development than onshore wind. But if we look now in Europe, the offshore wind energy sector is doubling every year. Uh, you see countries like the United Kingdom that are very, very eager to expand their abilities and their capacity in that area. We have a number of U.S. states that are looking to develop offshore wind energy projects in the Great Lakes. Uh, Ontario has indicated an interest in the past, and I'm quite confident that we will see developments there. The wind resource is better the opportunity to produce power is tremendous. Do you see any ri risks to the wind in industry in Ontario with potential for a change in government this fall? I think any time you, you have a situation where uh, energy, is, energy and electricity are very political issues in, in any jurisdiction in Canada. And so any time you go through an electoral process it introduces uncertainty and the possibility of policy change. Uh, we believe and we are trying to work to, uh, to speak with all parties to have them recognize and understand some of the opportunities and benefits that wind energy does present to Ontario. Uh, we do have, it's clear, different perspectives within the political spectrum on this. Um, it's still very early in terms of understanding what the details around those mean but we're quite confident in terms of working with all parties that we can make a very convincing case that wind energy is something that we're seeing grow rapidly around the world, bringing benefits to communities around the world, and we think everyone will come around and recognize that that's the case, an opportunity for Ontario as well. Is it possible to put wind turbines two kilometers away from property lines? If not, why? In the case of Ontario, um, where land has historically been divided in a certain way, um, there are some challenges in terms of setback distances, in terms of uh, trying to find uh, an opportunity. For example, if you move from one property line, you may run into another property line and you can't find a space in between. That varies from region to region of Ontario. Uh, at the end of the day, in Ontario, we have setbacks for wind turbines of 550 meters. Uh, those setbacks are among the most stringent in North America. 
And as an industry, we're required to meet those setbacks and are working very hard to ensure that we meet all of those regulatory requirements. How is Canway working to make electricity more affordable and accessible to the homes of Canadians in the far north? It's an interesting question. In, in the far north, what we have are many, many communities, often First Nations communities, that rely very heavily on diesel fuel as a source of electricity. Um, we are talking here in Ontario and debating 13 cents for wind or 12 cents for hydro. Uh, in the north, you pay $1.50 per kilowatt hour for electricity from diesel. There are a number of those northern communities that do have a good wind resource. Others have a good hydro resource. And there's a lot of work going on to find opportunities to partner renewables with those diesel technologies to help reduce the pollution impacts associated with those diesel projects but also to provide economic benefits in terms of driving down the cost. And we're seeing, we've seen pilot projects in Newfoundland, BC, and Quebec are all moving forward with new initiatives as well. Uh, where is wind energy in Canada growing most quickly? The major markets for wind energy at the moment in Canada are not surprisingly the largest provinces, BC, Alberta, Quebec, and Ontario. Quebec today has about 600 megawatts of wind, but has signed almost 3,000 megawatts of contracts that are due to come online over the next five years. So you're going to see very rapid growth. In Ontario, we've moved very quickly from 15 megawatts a few years ago to more than 1,500 megawatts today and have contracts in place that will double that going forward. Alberta has about 700 megawatts or 800 megawatts in place today, but they're building new transmission to connect 3,000 megawatts in additional wind energy to the system. So we're seeing rapid growth in a number of jurisdictions, but there's a number of different ways to measure leadership in that regard. Prince Edward Island gets 18% of its electricity from wind energy today. What are the prospects for offshore wind energy development? I mean, the prospects are very positive in, in many ways. I think the challenge and the, the issues associated with offshore wind energy development is that you have, in essence, a uh, tremendous wind resource which will allow you to produce more power, but you also have more costs. It is more costly to build an offshore wind energy project than an onshore wind energy project. When that, finding that balance will determine when investors move towards the offshore as opposed to investing onshore. But as I've indicated, that's already begun in Europe, where in some countries, many of the best available onshore opportunities have now been utilized and they're looking for additional opportunities, and it will come to North America as well. How is CANWE collaborating with other renewable resource industries? There are other associations like our own. Uh, CANSIA, the Canadian Solar Industries Association, uh, Geothermal Association, uh, a couple of associations working in biomass. Um, we do work together in terms of looking at some of the opportunities to move forward and grow the renewable energy contribution to the electricity grid in Canada. And within that context, it's also very important for us to be collaborating with hydropower. The Canadian Hydropower Association, the Ontario Water Power Association, because together, there's an opportunity to really provide virtually all of Canada's electricity through renewable energy sources if we decided to go down that path. Hydroelectricity already counts for 60% of Canada's electricity and is an excellent partner for wind and other renewables. The Paul Muir Trust in the United Kingdom released a, re a report a couple of days ago that indicates that the UK may have to abandon their objectives to increase wind output as it has been found to greatly increase the need for fossil fuel backup generation. What makes Ontario different? What we have found, I, guess what I shouldn't say what we have found, because the people that really have to answer this question are system operators. These are the people who work in different jurisdictions and have the job of ensuring that supply equals demand, a very, very important job. And when you introduce technologies into the system like wind that are variable, that introduces a new challenge for those system operators. They have to be prepared to deal with times when renewable energy production goes up or goes down and to balance that. In North America, there's a group called the Utility Wind Integration Group, which is made up of utilities from across North America who are addressing and looking at the challenges of how to integrate wind energy effectively into the system. What that group has said, based on studies from across the continent, 
is that you can go to 10% wind energy penetration. We're at 2% now in Canada, but you can go to 10% wind energy penetration and rely essentially on existing reserve capacities. Okay? When you go beyond that, you do need to look at some more innovative solutions to be able to go forward. It's true that there will be time for wind production ramps down, and you need something else to produce. In Canada, we're very fortunate that because we have 60% of our electricity coming from hydro, that in many, many cases across the country, that backup is going to be provided by surplus hydro capacity, which will continue to produce clean electricity going forward. Wind farms co uh, cover a large area. How much land would be required to meet the vision you have outlined? When we developed the wind vision document, we looked at sort of the standard spacing that you would need between wind turbines to uh, just determine what that land area would be. We found you could produce 20% of Canada's electricity by putting wind turbines in Canada in an area that essentially covered this, the, the geography of Prince Edward Island. It is a significant land area, probably less than many of you would have imagined. But Adarsh made a point in her presentation which is very important, which is out of that land area, only 3 to 4% of that land is actually utilized by turbines, transmission lines, substations. And the rest of the land can continue to be used for its existing purposes, whether it's grazing cattle, whether it's growing crops. And so from that perspective, we think the land use issue with respect to wind turbines is, is often overplayed a little bit, I guess, in that sense, because most of that land remains available for productive use. What opportunities exist to use wind energy in urban areas? We are seeing, uh, I would say, increasing interest within urban communities in terms of using what we call small wind energy systems to produce power uh, on homes or on uh, commercial buildings. Um, the challenge is there, the, f the first one is that the wind resource is not as good. Um, you have more barriers, more obstacles to the wind in urban areas. And that has an impact on the economics of projects. Nonetheless, we do see growing investment and interest in this area. You can go to Canadian Tire now and purchase a small wind turbine and move forward. You see an increasing number of commercial operations, whether it's Walmart or Zellers or others, that are installing wind turbines, auto dealerships installing wind turbines on their property. So this is a growing area, but in Canada, we're really only at the beginning of that, but it's something where we expect to see significant growth going forward. What happens when the wind stops blowing? <laughs> we end up in precisely the situation I spoke of earlier where you need, when, when, because wind is a variable source of electricity, it does have to be partnered with other technologies. At the current time, that usually means it's going to be partnered with another form of generation. And I mentioned earlier hydro being a good partner for wind. Part of the reason that hydro is a good partner for wind is because when wind energy production slows down, you can release more water through a dam and produce more electricity. When wind energy production ramps up, you can close the dam and store energy, in essence, behind the dam in the reservoir. Um, so, essentially, wind is not, and I mean, we're talking about 20% here in terms of where we envision wind going. Wind can play a significant role in Canada's electricity market, but wind will need to work with other technologies. And that's important because the electricity system continues to diversify. We will continue to need all sorts of electricity production, but wind can play a much, much stronger role than it does today. Last question. Does can we have a portfolio of information on liabilities of wind turbines? I need to think exactly what that means, but I guess in terms of some of the, I guess it's looking at some of the challenges or some of the issues or concerns that people have raised associated with wind energy development. We do have on our website a significant amount of issue related to commonly raised questions about wind energy questions that people have raised with respect to issues like impact on property values, impact on birds and bats and others. And we certainly encourage people to go and have a look at those resources. Um, they will often, often also direct you to other resources as well. Um, because we do want to ensure that when we have dialogue, and as wind continues to grow, we're going to have more and more and more dialogue going forward 
about wind energy, renewable energy, our electricity system. We want to ensure to the extent possible that everyone is working with the best available information. So certainly encourage you to have a look at our website, www.canwea.ca. And if that truly was the last question, it felt like uh, being shot at up here, but thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, sir. That was great. I'd like to ask Noble Chumar to come up and thank our uh, presenters. Thanks, Tim. Uh, one thing's for certain, and uh, it was missed in, uh, in the presentation, is that uh, one of the greatest things from my perspective uh, about wind energy is that it keeps lawyers very, very busy. Um, only a couple of tables that laugh. My clients brought power didn't laugh all that much there. But uh, uh, Adarsh uh, and, and Robert, thank you so much for uh, taking the time today on behalf of the Board of Directors at the Empire Club uh, and our guests and our sponsors, our sponsor Gowlings, uh, thank you very much uh, for, uh, for your insight and for inspiring us to uh, dream about a world uh, that will one day hopefully be uh, uh, sustained entirely by renewable energy. Thank you. If you have a qu I'd be happy to answer your question uh, later on We're on a time constraint with our uh, television broadcast. Uh, okay, um, as a token of our appreciation, I'd like to present to Robert and Adarsh um, a book put out which is called Who Said That? Memorable Notes, Quotes, and Anecdotes Selected from the Empire Club of, Spe of Canada Speeches, 1903 to 2003. Okay, a um, couple of uh, housekeeping things and then we'll clue up. Uh, upcoming speakers, Thursday, April 19th, Jason Myers, President and CEO, Canadian Manufacturers Association here in the Royal York. Wednesday, the 27th of uh, April, Louis Vachon, President and CEO, National Bank Financial, and that is in the King Edward Hotel. On Thursday, May 12th, Peter Gilligan, Founder and CEO of Matabee Homes, and that's in the Royal York as well. I'd like to thank Gowlings for being our event sponsor. Thank you to St. Lawrence College and Great Lake Breweries for uh, our student table sponsors. Thank you to the National Post as our media sponsor. We are being broadcast on Rogers uh, TV. We'll be replayed um, on CPAC uh, through the next several weeks. We are very grateful to them for their support. Uh, believe it or not, yes, the Empire Club is on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you all for coming. We look forward to seeing you again. And uh, this meeting is now adjourned. Enjoy your afternoon.